Hi, welcome to Highland Hills Church. We're so glad you've joined us today. Pastor John Mark will be speaking to us today about how God might be using this pandemic for His will in your life. It is our desire that you will hear from Him today. If we can help you in any way with your walk with the Lord, please don't hesitate to let us know. Now let's join our praise team in worshiping the Lord. Welcome to Highland Hills Online. It's good to be here in order to just worship the Lord through music and song. Just uh, right now, just empty your, your minds out of anything that's uh, related to this, uh, this pandemic and just let it be just you and him in worship. of our ever-changing lives, the best we have to offer. We don't just lift up our hands, Lord, we lift up our lives, for we know that you are worthy of our praise. You are the song's praise. Rescue from darkness, we Walking in marvelous times, for we are children of the
prerequisite for you to be able to seek the Lord. Just as you are, he wants you to come and to seek him so that he can meet you. If you know him, you remember just how amazing it was for you to just step and meet with Jesus. Those of you who don't know, it's a wonderful thing. Highly recommend you would be serious and just seek him through prayer. Ask him to come because there's, like I said, no requisites. So 
souls, Lord, to you and to your hands we commit because we can't do it on our own. God, we just, in, in uncertain times, we, we go wandering off and doing our own things, God, because we're scared. But, Lord, your perfect love casts out all of that, all of the fear. And so we come to you. We will put our hope and trust in you so that we can be with you, Lord, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. like to wish a happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers out there. Truly being a mom is such an important job. And we'd like to take this opportunity to pray for all of you. Please join us as we pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we bring our moms to your feet. Father, we thank you for their sacrifice. We thank you for their selflessness. We thank you for their time, their effort. Thank you for all that our mothers do. We lift them up to you, especially during these times, Father, and ask for an extra special blessing for our moms. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. We love you, moms. Let me just add, happy Mother's Day. Well, this is the seventh week that we've been meeting this way, or church online. People are asking the question, when are we going to meet again? Well, I can tell you this, we're gonna be able to meet together before Christmas. But seriously, uh, we are evaluating the information coming from Carson City, uh, the phases that the governor's uh, outlining, and we are putting plans and procedures in place. You should know that uh, as a church staff and a few leaders, we've already been starting the process of talking about what that's going to look like. We want to be sure that when we do come back together, that we're safe that we have the right uh, sanitation procedures in effect, social distancing, both to keep you safe and also our community. We hope to come up with a plan and to communicate that uh, as soon as we have some hard dates and be able to get that to you. So make sure that you are on our email list and also you can check our website for the most up-to-date information. Now, uh, in a couple of weeks, or I should say next Sunday, we're kicking off a new sermon series called Persevering in Hope. It's a study of the New Testament book, 1 Peter. Now, 1 Peter was written to believers that were under persecution and facing very difficult and challenging times. And while those circumstances may be different, the truth of God's word and the principles of God's word are still the same. And I believe that it will be great help for us as we study the book of 1 Peter. And let me invite you to go ahead and uh, read ahead. It doesn't take very long to read the entire book. We're going to be going through it, maybe not quite verse by verse, but at least uh, section by section, uh, gleaning from it what God would show us, help us, uh, guide us during our times of challenges. Today, I want to talk about God and the coronavirus. Today, I want to talk about kind of a big picture point of view. Uh, what is God trying to show us and teach us during this pandemic? Before we jump into that, uh, let me make a couple of introductory remarks. Uh, first, you might object and say, well, how do we know what God is doing? Well, that's a valid question. Uh, we don't know all that God is doing. We do know that God is at work. We've talked about that in recent weeks. 
Jesus said, my father is always at work and I'm here to join him at work. God invites every believer to join him where he is at work. So we know that God is working, but how can we definitively say exactly what he is doing? Well, we can't as far as all of the specifics. Uh, God is doing uh, a myriad of things with the coronavirus. And God may be doing uh, a myriad of things just in your life alone. But what we can say is that there are some general principles and patterns of God's work that we can discern. In the New Testament, the authors give us uh, some handles and some um, encouragement to seek the Lord and allow him to reveal his will to us. So we may not know all that God is doing, but we can know some of the things that God is doing. In Luke chapter 12, verse 56 and 57, Jesus criticized the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, because they didn't know what God was doing. They hadn't taken the time to ask that question. This is what he said, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present times? Basically, Jesus said, you can predict the weather and what is about to happen by the way the sky looks, but why aren't you tuned in to what God is doing? And so that's what I want us to do, is to be tuned in with some of the, uh, the big picture things that God is doing through the coronavirus. Now, before we do that, uh, I'd like for us just to have a word of prayer, a time of prayer. I want to lead you in prayer to center ourselves and to focus ourselves on what God would have to teach us what he wants to say to us uh, today. In Exodus 15, a passage of scripture called the Song of Moses, he utters these words, who is like you? speaking of the Lord, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. Of course, the answer to that is uh, no one. But let's use these ideas to guide us in our time of prayer. Let's just bow our heads right where you are and let me lead you and then I will close with a prayer for all of us. So with our heads bowed, the first thing we like to do in prayer is to praise God. So praise God for his holiness, that he is majestic in his holiness, awesome in glory, and working wonders. Next, it's always good to thank God in times of challenges and crises. Uh, we focus on ourselves and what we don't have. Thanksgiving is a great time to focus on what we do have. How has God blessed you? What are some things that you are thankful for? Just mention these to the Lord right now. When we pray, we always want to confess and repent and ask God to search our hearts and to reveal to us our selfishness, our pride, our rebellion, our going our own way. Take a few moments and do that. Confess the sin to the Lord. Ask him to forgive you of your sin. And finally, let me invite you to pray this prayer. I'll open my eyes, Lord, that I might behold wonderful things from your law. Open my eyes, Lord, that I might behold wonderful things from your law. That's a verse from Psalm 119. Well, let me close this in our prayer time. Father, we do praise you that you are holy. You are transcendent, unlike any. There's no one like you, that you are awesome in your glory. And we praise you for that. We thank you for the blessings that we enjoy that your mercies are new every day. Great is your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to confess our sin, that you are a forgiving and merciful God. 
we lay our sin before you. We confess it. And we thank you for your forgiveness. And we do pray that you would open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God and the coronavirus. What is God doing with the coronavirus pandemic? How are we to learn from it? Well, the passage of scripture I want us to turn to is found in John's gospel, John chapter 9. And really the whole chapter deals with the story of the man that was born blind and how he was healed, how he was uh, interrogated by the Pharisees, uh, his response, how Jesus uh, found him later. Uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter. I want to read the first uh, five verses and then to summarize uh, the events that happened. So as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So naturally, the disciples saw a man that was blind, uh, handicapped. Uh, we could say someone, this would be true for anyone that was uh, diseased or sick or any tragedy or any crisis. And said, why is this happening? Uh, why did God cause this to happen? Is this a judgment from the Lord upon this man? And Jesus said, no, neither him nor his parents. That's not what's happening. But this is so that God may be glorified. And then he continued, he said, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, don't miss the connection between Jesus saying that he is the light of the world and then for him bringing light to the man that's in spiritual or I should say physical darkness. Jesus wants to bring light to all that are in darkness and specifically or most notably those in spiritual darkness. Well, after saying this, he made some mud. He put it on the man's eyes. He told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he did. And the man was healed. His friends and neighbors said, how were you healed? He said, uh, the man made some mud. He put it on my eyes. He told me to wash and I was healed. The Pharisees heard of this healing. And they brought the man who had been born blind to the Pharisees. And they said, uh, how were you healed? He said, a man made mud. He put it on my eyes, I washed, and I was healed. And John tells us, kind of an aside, but very importantly, oh, and by the way, this happened on the Sabbath day. Now you can see the, uh, the, the wrong road that religion takes when it becomes more concerned about its rules than about people's relationship with the Lord. And the Pharisees, uh, were focused upon the rules. They were the religious police that were saying there should be no unauthorized miracles and certainly not happening on the Sabbath where you have to work to make mud and for that healing to occur. Well, back to the story. They talked to him for a while. They brought his parents in. They wanted to make sure that this was the man that was born blind. His parents said, yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind. But we don't know how he was healed. Uh, he's old enough. You can ask him. And there was some fear on the part of the parents of uh, going up against the Pharisees because they didn't want to be put out. That is excommunicated from the synagogue. They brought the man who was born blind back in, the seeing man now, and said, give glory to God. Uh, we know that this man is a sinner because he does works on the Sabbath. And he says, well, how could he be a sinner and do these great works of miracles? And uh, they questioned him more. Uh, he asked them, why do you want to know all of this? I've told you everything that I know. Uh, are you wanting to become his disciples? And they got angry with him. 
uh, verse 34 says, you were steeped in sin at birth. Talking about the man born blind. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. That's literally, they were excommunicated him from the Jewish community in the synagogue. Well, Jesus heard that they'd thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you now see him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And the text tells us this. He worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. There's another interaction with some Pharisees that were standing there and they heard this and said, are you saying that we are spiritually blind? And Jesus said, if the shoe fits, no, he didn't say that colloquial idiom, but he did respond to them saying that, yes, uh, you are spiritually blind. Well, back to our topic today. So what is God doing in the coronavirus? Well, I want to use that metaphor of opening eyes for our uh, points. And so point number one is this. In the coronavirus, God wants to open eyes to the horror of sin. God wants to open eyes to the horror of sin. He wants to open our eyes. He wants to open the eyes of the world to the horror of sin. Now we know, and we talked about this last week in Romans chapter 8, verses 20 and 21, that because of sin, Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve disobeying God, that the curse that came with the consequences of sin was not just spiritual, but also physical. Uh, Romans 8 talks about how creation was subjugated to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. So these words, curse, death, decay, other translations, futility, uh, they speak of the physical reality of sin. And that's the way that God created the earth. And that is the consequences of sin. Physical pain and suffering is a picture, is a uh, loud symbol that gets our attention that something is not right with this world. That all is not uh, uh, wonderful and rainbows and sunshine. Uh, sin and physical aspect of that opens our eyes to the fact that there is sin and that the world is, in a word, uh, broken. Let me read a quote from John Piper. He said, God put the physical world under a curse so that the physical horrors we see around us in what God is doing through the coronavirus, diseases and calamities would become a vivid picture of how horrible sin is. In other words, physical evil is a parable, a drama, a signpost pointing to the moral outrage of rebellion against God. He goes on to talk about how we really don't think of our sins as belittling God, but we do that every time we sin. The coronavirus and disease and physical suffering is a way for us to see that things aren't right. And it's an outrage against a holy God. The world that's cursed, as well as humanity that continues to live on their own. Our sin against God is deadly serious and physical suffering shows us that things are not right. Let me read another quote. This is from C.S. Lewis. Perhaps you've heard it. Pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone 
to rouse a deaf world. Or it's his way of bringing light to a blind world that's blind to sin and blind to rebellion against God. God is using the coronavirus to open eyes to sin so the people will turn to him. Number two, in the coronavirus, God wants to open eyes to humankind's need for him. And once we realize that there's sin, uh, we need a sin bearer. We need someone to fix that sin. Of course, mankind tries to fix that on our own. Our own efforts to cover up our sin are always going to come up short like Adam and Eve sewing fig leaves together to cover their shame. They needed God to provide the clothing to cover their sin and their shame. Just like the blind mean man needed healing. The coronavirus is God's wake-up call that we need the Lord, that we need healing. Jesus physically healed this man. But the great thing and the beautiful thing, and maybe you didn't pick up on the reading, and I invite you to go back and read chapter 9, is that Jesus healed this man spiritually. There was physical healing, but then there was spiritual healing. We know that he worshipped him, the text tells us. God uses physical infirmities to bring people to himself for really what's more important the spiritual healing. Suffering was the way to bring this man to the Lord. When he encountered Jesus, he was healed by him. He believed in him as his Savior. The man's pain and suffering was turned into salvation and a oneness with the Lord. And God wants to use the coronavirus for that as well. In our pleasure, let me read this uh, from a blogger. This person said, pain gets our attention, prompting us to ask where it came from and what we can do to protect those that we love. Priorities come into sharp focus and scream to be reevaluated when the things we value most are threatened. Pandemic even terrifies many into considering what, what awaits when we leave this earth. Well, that's a valid question to ask. With the death toll rising every day in our state, in our country, around the world with the coronavirus, do we know where we will be after death? And that's really not a plural question. Do you know where you will be? Each of us needs to ask that question. Do I know that I know that Jesus is my Savior, that he's paid the penalty for my sin. I've asked him to be my atonement for my sin, and I have the promise and the hope of heaven. You know, the Bible talks about the book of life in several places, in the book of Revelation and also in the New Testament. Jesus talks about names being written in the Lamb's book of life. Let me ask you that question. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? I believe God is using the coronavirus to have people ask that question, maybe not in a specific way. For them to ask, do I know where I will spend eternity? God is using the coronavirus to open our eyes to our need for Him. Number three, in the coronavirus, God wants to open eyes for believers to live for him. That is for believers, for us to realign our lives, for us to ask, are my priorities in order? For us to consider uh, what's most important. Now, point number two, the coronavirus God is using, I believe, to cause lost people, people without Christ, to come to him. And we want to pray for that. We want to pray that God brings good from this. Satan means it for evil, but God can bring good. Now, point number three, this one that we're under right now, this is for the believer, not for the lost to come to Christ, but for the believer to evaluate 
how they are living. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus is confronted and asked about Pilate killing Galileans, or excuse me, Pilate killing those that were in the temple, mixing their blood in the temple. And then he talks about uh, a tower in Galilee that fell upon 18 people. And the question is, uh, why did that happen? Was that God's judgment? Was he wanting to kill those people and he finally got them all together in one place and the tower fell on them? Or was something else at work? The people wanted to know, was this a specific judgment? Was God angry at them? But this is Jesus' response. It's, it, it's different. It's uh, jolting. He says this, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you likewise will perish. No, they weren't killed because of judgment. But let's not talk about them. Let's talk about you and your repentance. Now, I could tell this story for point number two, for the lost. But I believe it also applies for believers, what we're talking about here. That we need to repent. That we need to be concerned that we are living rightly for the Lord. In Luke chapter 9, the chapter begins where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ. You know the story. They're in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus says, who do the people say that I am? The disciples answer. Some say you're a great prophet. You're John the Baptist uh, in spirit, that you're like uh, Elijah. Um, Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And I always like to point out, it doesn't matter what other people say. There are always other people saying other things about Jesus. What matters is who do you say that Jesus is? And Peter answering for the group said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah, God's Son. And so that's a high watermark for the disciples. Immediately after that, Jesus predicts his death. He says, I must go to Jerusalem. I'll be handed over to the scribes and the Pharisees, and I'll be put to death. And then he gives these verses. You may not want to write them down. Uh, Luke 9, 23 and following. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when they come into the glory and in the glory of the Father and his holy angels. God is using the coronavirus for us, church, for believers, to be asking the question, am I denying myself? Am I taking up my cross daily? Am I following Jesus? Am I living for him? Or am I trying to save my own life? What good is it to profit the whole world, yet lose your very self? Where is your heart? Is God using these circumstances to invite you to repent, to realign yourself with him? I like that phrase. Uh, our cars, sometimes we... Uh, by virtue of just driving them for a while, or maybe we'll hit a curb, we'll go out of alignment, and we have to have them realigned. God is using the coronavirus for us, church, to be realigned with him, for us to be living the transformed life, uh, the life that he has given us through new birth in Christ. God wants us to be exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, and this is our opportunity to return, to uh, reconfess or recommit to following the Lord. Number four, lastly, God wants to use the coronavirus to open eyes of the world to his church and his people. Let me explain that. God wants to use the coronavirus to open the eyes of the world to the salt and light and the love of the Christian community. 
Now, we've not always done a good job of this, but when we have excelled in our unique version of generosity and self-giving, uh, the Lord has used it in great effect. Let me refer to our text, verse 4 and 5 that I read earlier. Jesus said, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Point number four is this. Are you allowing your light to shine? Are you hiding it under a bushel? God wants us to allow our light to shine. And he uses that in times of crisis for a world to see that there is a community, a people, God's people, uh, that are different. In Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Blessed are you when you others revile you, persecute you, utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And then he says immediately, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You see, generosity and giving during times of distress and even uh, persecution speak very loud with a megaphone. Now, we're not under persecution, but it's the same principle in this disaster, this pandemic, and this crisis. When we let our light shine, when we become the salt that God wants us to, uh, to be, uh, the world is able to see that. Lots of people are kind and gracious in times of prosperity when the goodness and generosity are relatively easy. But when gener generosity is costly, when it comes at a personal cost, that's when the gospel, the good news, the transformation of God's power in human life shines forth. At the center of our faith is a Savior who laid down his life for his enemies. And it's in moments like these that all of us, as believers, need to go forward and to be the light that God wants us to be. Historian Rodney Stark has written a book called The Triumph of Christianity. He points out in the first centuries of the Christian church, the truly revolutionary principle of Christian love and charity was not really known. It was not really expanded beyond the boundaries of the family faith. But then two great plagues struck the Roman world, one in 165 AD, one in 251. Now, all of a sudden, outside the Christian church, uh, there was a need for mercy and for sacrifice. So much so that the Christians responded when the physicians fled to their country estates. Those with symptoms were cast out of homes. Priests forsook the temples. But Stark observes Christians claimed to have the answers, and most of all, they took appropriate actions. The actions included the forgiveness of sin through Christ and the hope of eternal life beyond death. This was a pre precious message in a season of medical helplessness and other hopelessness. As for their actions, large numbers of Christians cared for the sick and the dying. And toward the end of the second plague, Bishop Dionysus of Alexandria wrote a letter extolling the members of his church that most of our brothers showed love and loyalty, never sparing themselves, thinking only of one another. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, putting to silence the ignorance of the emperors. <clears throat> Stay with me. In <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the three hundreds, Emperor Julian wanted to bring back the Roman mythical religions, but he said. It's hard with the Christians. And he wrote a letter. And listen to what he said in the letter. He said, uh, The Christian faith has been specially advanced to the loving service rendered to strangers 
and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans, that's the Christians, care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us in vain look in vain for help when, that we should render to them. Now, that was a long story. I don't know if you follow all of that. But during the plagues in the early centuries, it was the Christians that stepped forward to help. So much so that an emperor, a hundred years later, said that we can't do anything about these self-giving, these loving, these self-sacrificing believers, followers of Jesus. Would it be so that the church today would be known under that fashion, that we are self-giving, self-sacrificing, generous, helping those in need. And as the coronavirus that presents uh, a theater, an opportunity to display the fruit of the Spirit, that God has changed our hearts and our lives, and we know what's most important, not ourselves, but to love God and to love others. God is doing many things during this pandemic. I've just mentioned four, but that's enough for us to ask, where does God want us to respond to him today? How has he spoken to us? Or to use our metaphor, what spiritual eyes has God opened? Or what do we see that we need to respond to. Remember point number one was about sin, that the pandemic is a picture of sin. Do we see sin as rebellion against God? The moral horror of doing our own thing. Point number two was about getting saved or the lost understanding that uh, we're gonna die. Am I ready for that? We wanna help you if you don't know that your name is written in that book that's in heaven. Point number three was for the believer to realign their lives, their perspective, their priorities. I suspect all of us as believers need to confess and to uh, remind ourselves again that Jesus is Lord of all. And finally, point number four, for us as believers to be the church, while I am sitting in our church building, this isn't the church. You are the church. God's inviting you to act like the church, particularly now, for this time, for such a time as this. Well, I want us to have an invitation time of sorts. Uh, I've asked Sambi to come and Caroline, they're gonna sing and you listen to the words of this song and you spend these moments. Uh, don't get up and leave and start doing other things, but allow God to speak to you. And after the song, I'll come back with a wrap up. Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest And without you, I fall apart Cause you're the one that guides my heart Lord, I need you, oh I found is where you are 
And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. So teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when i cannot stand i'll fall on you jesus you're my hope and stay lord i need you oh i What a great message that we need the Lord. If God was speaking to you today, we want to help you in your faith journey. Contact us through email, call the church. You can text me. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with you, pray with you about your next step in following him. Well, in our regular worship services, this is when we would have our offering time. I want to thank you for being faithful in giving. Our church has held steady through both uh, March and April, and it's because of you and your generosity that that's happened. We thank you for keeping the ministries and missions that we support going. Uh, I finally, let me just say that I hope you'll join us next week. I uh, begin reading 1 Peter as we look to see what God wants to say to us about persevering in hope in Christ. God bless you. Have a great week.